Comments made on the following paid commercial program are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show. On the program this week, tax tips with David Ingram, money marshals, and our special guest, BC Premier Gordon Campbell. Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show. I'm Sterling Fox and today we are on location at the BC government offices on the Vancouver waterfront to interview our special guest, BC Premier Gordon Campbell. Premier, welcome. Thanks, Sterling. Welcome back to you too. Great well, to be here. Well, it's good to have you. We appreciate the hospitality you. down at your offices yeah, here. Anything we can do to help, right? Well, we appreciate it. Lots to talk about, lots in the news these days. I want to start with EHST. Sure. Uh, the uh, let's assume for a moment that this petition business accomplishes its mission mm -hmm. and the uh, appropriate number of signatures are achieved in all 85 writings right. then you're confronted with two possibilities mm -hmm. uh, send it to committee to turn it into a referendum or take the bill attached to the petition right. to the house and deal with it there right any idea what you're going to do yet you know, I, I, first I want to see what happens with the petition. I, I know that they've got, they claim uh, they've got the number of signatures required. There's a lot of work to be done by the chief electoral officer. And of course, you know, there's laws that control how the petition's gathered as well as what we do with it afterwards. Sure. So we've said we'll follow that up. So for example, no one can have signed the petition twice. Uh, it's got to be, uh, the signatures have got to be from the right person. Uh, they've got to have a proper, uh, you know, a person in, in, involved with actually receiving the signature. Uh, there can be, there's a whole series of things like that. So the chief electoral officer will do that, uh, assuming that in fact there are enough. Then it goes to a parliamentary committee, which is an all-party committee, including the NDP and the government side, and they will make the choice on should it go to a plebiscite or should it go to a referendum or should it go to the House for consideration. I, I actually don't have a particular personal choice with regard to that. I really do think it's up to the parliamentary committee to, to look at the situation, make their own choices and their recommendations to the House, and the House will make a decision. If they decide to go for a referendum, it'll be held in September of 2011. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's kind of the time frame that it will take place. If they decide they're going to submit a, the, the piece of legislation to the House, uh, then that will be in the next year's session, I assume. Okay. Now, if uh, the petition goes forward, now, the, first of all, the committee that this petition, after being validated by Elections BC, Correct. is a, a committee of the House, as you've identified. Correct. It's dominated, however, by government MLAs, correct? Well, the, every legislative committee, there is a majority of MLAs, private members who are the government, uh, and there is uh, also opposition members. Only the Public Accounts Committee is chaired by an opposition member, but uh, yes, it's an all-party committee and they will make their recommendations to the House. Are they, however, given that the majority is Liberal MLAs, yep. are they going to take their marching orders from you or are you going to sit back and see what they recommend to you? Well, I think there's a lot of myth out there about how actually caucuses work. At least our caucus works that we uh, actually listen to one another. There's no one that goes in and says, this is, the, this is what's happening, thank you very much. Uh, we all work together to do what we hope will be in the best interest of British Columbia. I can't say what the committee will do. I can't even say the processes they'll go through because that will be up to them. So it's a legislative committee. It's not a government committee. It's a committee of the legislature and they will make recommendations to the legislature. I'm sure our members of the committee will report back to our caucus just as the opposition members will report back to their caucus. They will make a recommendation and uh, we'll get on with it. In the wake of the imposition of the HST, yeah. are you at all taken aback by the emotional backlash that has occurred? Well, I think that there's a couple of things. I think, first of all, we, I've said this before, I, I don't think we did as good a job of going out and explaining to people why we took these steps. I think there's a lot of people that think we didn't tell them the truth in the election, right? And uh, we did, but that doesn't matter. They've decided that they don't think we did. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that this is a very powerful thing to do for the economy. It, it, you know, really, if you go back to last July, why did we make this decision? When we knew up front that there were going to be lots of political impacts of it. Well, the first reason you make it is because it actually saved us $1.6 billion of debt that we would have to impose on our kids. The federal government provides $1.6 billion in transition funding that we could use, we could use over a three-year period. We've already actually spent about uh, probably between 
$250 and $500 million of that. There's another $500 million that we have left to go in this year of the 2010-11 budget, and then the balance will be in the 2011-12 right, budget. Right, it's a three-year deal. Right. But we, you know, last year, in 2009-10, we used $250 million of those dollars to support health care and education. So we were very concerned that we had committed to protect health care and education. We actually increased funding for health care substantially and education as well substantially. Uh, we did those two things because we think they're critical public services. We found savings throughout government, but we were still facing a substantial deficit, as sure. you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, frankly, we were a government that was elected saying we weren't going to load up our debts uh, on our kids in the future. I so, seem to recall those campaign promises. Exactly. Yes. So we so we decided that, you know, yes, this was something we should do for, for that reason to start with. Second reason, supporting the public services. Third reason is, as we went through the campaign, we were pretty clear we were going to come out of this economic downturn even stronger than we went in. And this is something that has been called for for a long time uh, by small businesses across the province. For example, the Chamber of Commerce has been calling for it since the early 2000s. Other businesses from the 1990s. The whole business of streamlining the taxation process. Exactly, okay. exactly. So here's the issue that comes up with regard to that. We have to be competitive in the global economy when you look at what the strength of our economy is. Forestry, mining, energy, agriculture, uh, you know, all of those things actually benefit from us having a more competitive tax regime. So what we were told was across the province, uh, we would save about $150 million in what they call compliance costs. Now that's a significant benefit uh, for businesses, but also I think one of the things that we know for let me let me just use this watch as an example. So I take my watch a off visual here. Visual aid. It's okay. a, so this watch, I have I paid provincial sales tax on this. All right. I, I feel like I paid once because you know what? I only went to the counter once and they said here it is and thank you very much. Here, give me your sales tax. But you know I don't have any idea how much sales tax was paid as we did that as we got this little piece of metal done as we got this this armband done as we put it all together. So a piece of equipment you pay sales tax on. That's included, you know. So uh, we I often use forestry as an issue because it's a big industry here. So when the person goes out onto the land base and decides to cut a tree, they're paying sales tax on their saw, they're paying sales tax on their shoes, they're paying sales tax on their et cetera, et cetera. So there's layer after layer after layer after layer after layer of provincial sales tax. It's included in our costs. And that's where you get the benefit. You get the benefit by taking those costs out and making our products more competitive in the global marketplace. So for our major trading products like forestry and mining and energy, uh, transportation, construction, there are literally substantial savings there because there's a, a tax credit that reduces their costs. Now, one of the discussions you've heard, I'm sure you've heard it from your people, I've heard it from Mr. Vanderson, no business will ever pass on a savings. To be candid about that, that's nonsense. Um, how much was your first cell phone? Oh, gosh, I can't even remember. A couple hundred bucks, though. Okay, so say 200 bucks. How much would you pay for a cell phone today? Uh, if I got a plan, nothing. Zero. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Why do you think it's down to zero? It's because there's competition sure, out there. Sure, sure. Uh, competition drives our costs down for consumers. So, uh, again, the evidence from the Atlantic provinces when they moved to an HST, was that competition actually drove down their costs. All of the savings came out of the system very early for consumers in the Atlantic provinces. We expect the same thing to happen here. So we had to make the decision, and I think one of the things that people say is, why did you make it so quickly? You know, why was it overnight? You know, you didn't talk about it in the election. In fact, in the election we said there was no flexibility, et cetera. You know, I think there's some very good reasons why we, did. we didn't consider it in the election. We made it quickly because if we didn't make it now, we were going to have to wait for up to two years before we could make okay, it. Okay, I'll hold you on that point, too, because we'll return to it. Our special guest on this week's edition of the Money and Wealth Show is the Premier of British Columbia, Gordon Campbell. And we'll be right back. My name is David Wolfen. I'm the president of Avino Silver and Gold Mines. Avino owns 100% of the historic Avino mine in Durango, Mexico. Mining dates back over 500 years, and under our control, we mined it for 27 years. We're starting on a new era of mining, and we plan to reopen the mine this year. Avino trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol ASM. For more information, call 604-682-3701 or visit the company's website, www.avino.com.